Well, it is just an honour to have every person that is here today, every person that's joining us online. And I know this is such a word from God. And I just wanted to start by just welcoming anybody here. If it is one of your first times, or maybe you are still really fresh to faith in in Jesus, or maybe you're just hearing about Jesus for the first time. It's just our absolute honour to have you with us. We exist for this very reason, to reach the world with the love of Jesus. That is why we do expansion. That is why we are here to serve a city because we know the truth of Jesus that has changed our world so completely. You know, people can come into church and think, oh, it's just full of perfect people. It's not full of perfect people at all. It's full of forgiven people. Forgiven people that have discovered the wonder of who our God is and the wonder of how He wants to transform our lives into His image. He is such an amazing God. So it's just awesome to have you here today. But as I was preparing for this message, I remembered this moment I had a few years ago and I was actually at home on my own having, uh, I think I was doing some prep and I received a phone call. And this phone call, they said it was the the Australian Taxation Department and that there was a warrant out for my arrest because there were some funds that were owing to their account. And we were pretty, this was a few years ago, so we were pretty new to Australia at that stage. So I immediately freaked out. I'm like, maybe we've missed something. Maybe we haven't done something right. We're so new to all of this. And so I start freaking out a little bit and she's like, it's okay, all we need today is some of your personal details. And so she asked us, she's asked some, you know, pretty superficial questions, which I was okay to answer. But then she started asking questions like, so how much have you got in your bank accounts? And this is where I was like, this is a little bit sus. And things like, what's your tax number? And I said to her, look, I'm not comfortable giving this information over the phone. And she started to get pretty stroppy with me. She's like, look, this is very serious. There is a warrant out for your arrest. So I'm going to get a police officer to give you a call right now. The next thing, my phone is phoning and it's a a guy on the other end of the phone with a very deep voice claiming to be a police officer. So I start to freak out just a little bit. And he's like, you know, this is Officer Robert and there is a warrant out for your arrest. We need these details. And so again, I said, though, look, I'm not comfortable doing this over the phone. You can come to my house, you know, and we can have this conversation face to face. And again, he got very upset with me and said, well, we'll be seeing you soon. And then hung up on me. And so I thought, well, I'll phone my local police station and just check how legitimate this is. So I phone them and they're like, ma'am, there is nothing out for your arrest at all. You can calm the farm. You're fine. Look, it sounds like it's identity theft. I'm like those dirty rats. So a few days later, they phone me again. They're like, you know, and they try it again. I'm like, this time I let them have it. I'm like, you people are unbelievable. How could you deceive people like this? This is the most rotten form of trying to get money. And then he goes to me on the phone. He's like, well, you're welcome and hung up on me. And I'm like, look, God, I haven't heard of you smiting somebody for a very long time, but this would be an awesome time to start. Furious. You know, as I was preparing this message, I really felt the heart of God in this. Because, you know, the whole thing of identity theft, it's rife in Australia at the moment. We are losing $3.1 billion a year as a nation because of identity theft. But I felt God say to me, you know what? It's far more than just that. See, because when it comes to spiritual sense, we have a very deceitful enemy who wants to take our identity, who wants to take our God-given identity that we have in Jesus Christ, who He has called us to be as His children, and he wants to rob us of that identity. And I'm, we are just seeing this rife in our society at the moment about how there is an enemy with an agenda to take down God's people and to rob us of who God has called us to be. Can I get an amen? So I want to do this message today called Identity Theft. See, it started in the garden with Eve. Adam and Eve, they were in this amazing relationship with God where they walked, they talked with Him, they had intimacy with Him. They knew no fear. They were completely confident in who they were, completely secure. They walked with no shame. But then the enemy came and he deceived Eve. Then Adam got in on it too and they went against God. They took the fruit and they went against what God had said. And because of it, then sin came and as humanity, we were separated from God. We were separated from walking with Him. And ever since then, humanity has been on the search to find who we are. 
Because the moment sin entered, shame entered. The moment sin entered, Eve and Adam, they tried to cover themselves. They were no longer free to walk with intimacy with God. And that's what sin does. It separates us from Jesus. And all through the world, we see this today. Humanity asking this question, who are we? You know, in 2021, Google released its most searched questions. And in regards to a who question, the most number one search question that humanity wrote was, who am I? Who am I? It's this constant search that's on the inside of us as people. Who am I? Where does my identity lie? Am I more than what I do? Am I more than my wealth? Am I more than my success? Am I more than my relationships? Who, is, who am I? What is the meaning of my life? It's amazing. In an interview which Elon Musk, the wealthiest man in the world today, was asked recently what his driving philosophy in life was. And he says this, it was to understand the meaning of human life. He wanted to understand why we're here, how we got here, and what is going on. See, if the most successful, influential, wealthiest man in the world is asking that question, it shows that none of it can be satisfied through anything this world has to offer. It's got to be beyond this world. And that's where Jesus comes into play. That's where our amazing Saviour came and He walked this earth to restore us to relationship to, with Jesus Christ. And not just to save us from our wrongs, not just to intervene so that we would walk in relationship with Jesus, but that He would restore who we were called to be. He would restore our identity. He would restore who we are called to be as sons and daughters of the living God. How amazing is Jesus? He didn't just come to save us, to, but to restore us. See, I love what Hosea 6 verse 2 says. And speaking about Jesus, he's prophesying about him coming. And he says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. When how incredible with that, and that Hebrew word presence, it's this face-to-face -face intimate relationship with Jesus. And when we have that kind of intimacy with Jesus, it transforms us, it changes us. See, I love Jesus speaking of how he was the good shepherd to the people, to his people. He says this, which is such a powerful passage of Scripture in John 10, verse 1 to 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice and call. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out on his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. They will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This is a figure of speech Jesus used. They did not understand he was, what he was saying to them. So Jesus went on again to say, I pray we have ears to hear it today. Truly, truly, Truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by them, he will be saved and they will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that may, they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, but the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is the hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. How powerful is that? I know my own and my own know me. So we are called to walk following the good shepherd. And as we do that, he leads us to pasture. He leads us to good things. He leads us to abundant life. I love that. And to help kind of, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to break down that passage of John 10 just a little bit more. And then I'm also going to look at the life of Simon Peter. Because I think the life of Simon Peter is the most amazing transformation that we see of someone who walks with Jesus, who makes that decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus completely transforms his life like he wants to do with every single one of us. He wants to transform us. He wants to make us into his image. I love with Simon Peter that 
uh, Jesus took him from just being Simon, which in the Hebrew means the one who hears, to Peter, which means the rock that we can build with. And see, God, Jesus wants to do that every single one of us. He wants to take us from people who just believe in Him, just have faith in Him, to people who are rock solid, knowing who we are in Jesus Christ, that He can build with us, that we are strong in who He has called us to be. So that's what I want to look at today. How do we find our identity? Through the invitation that Jesus gives us. And the first invitation that Jesus gives us is the invitation to belong. The invitation to belong. Matthew 4, verse 18, it talks about Jesus calling Peter. And he says, Peter is fishing away, and he says, All right, Peter, come and follow me. I just love that the first thing that Jesus did, one of the first things in his ministry, is he calls people to follow him. Where Once in the garden, man was separated. They once were walking with God and they were separated because of sin. And one of the first things that Jesus does when he comes to earth is he calls people to follow him, to walk with him again. How amazing is our God that he calls us to walk with him. And this was so counterculture in the Jewish culture that a rabbi would come and call someone to himself. With most rabbis, you had to prove yourself. You had to show that you were worthy of being their disciple. And so the fact that Peter was fishing showed that he wasn't good enough to be another disciple of a rabbi. But Jesus seeks him out. Jesus invites him. Jesus pursues him. And how amazing. We've got to hear it today. You have a God that pursues you. You have a God that is that is running after you, that is saying, hey, I'm here. I've done everything I can and my human power came and died on the cross that we could have intimate relationship with each other. Come on, I love how Jesus describes us as lost, but He came to find us. Come on, He pursued us. How amazing is our God that we are born to be in relationship with Him. We love because He first loved us. I love going back to John 10. It says, He called calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls his sheep by name. You know that you are called by him. You are personally known, intimately called by Jesus. He knows you intimately more than you even know yourself. And you are created to belong to him. When your life was started, your parents didn't just have a great night with each other. And then magically, accidentally, you were here. No, at the moment of conception, God breathed a spirit into you. You were ordained to be given life. You were ordained to belong to Jesus Christ. You were ordained to be His son and His daughter. You were no accident. And I was preparing this today. I felt the first layer that God just wanted to bring was everyone needs to hear it today. You were no accident. There are some of us that have been in this room who are online today and you've been told your whole life that you're just a mistake, that you don't really belong. But I'm here to tell you today that you have a God that breathed His Holy Spirit into you when you were in your mother's tummy, that you were ordained to belong to Him, to belong to Jesus Christ, to have a relationship knowing how secure you are in Him. He is such a good God and I have seen this firsthand in our family. Many of you will know this story, but some of you don't. My grandma, when she was just a young woman, was raped. And in those days, a rape, it didn't happen very often. And so my dad, he, he came into the world in a very broken state. Everyone just saw him as the kid who didn't belong. He was the only kid in his entire school that didn't have a dad. Even my grandma would tell him that he, he shouldn't have been there. He was a mistake. And so he grew up his whole, whole life just being told that he didn't belong. And obviously this messes you up pretty big as a kid. He would go, my grandma worked a lot, so he would go home to other people's house after school. One family that he went to, the mum wouldn't even give him a cookie with the rest of the kids because he didn't count. Wouldn't give him ice cream because he was the one that didn't count, he shouldn't really be here. And then until there was one point where Jesus intercepted his story. There was a Christian boy at school who invited him to his house. You know, the first thing that his mum did, how redeeming is our God, is gave him a cookie. It's the first thing. 
And through that relationship, they opened their home to my, my grandma and my dad. And dad says he still remembers as a little boy playing with their sons. They were this beautiful missionary family. And he heard them telling my grandma about Jesus, about how much he loved her, how much he had a plan. And through that relationship, my grandma became a Christian. And then years later, my dad then made the decision to follow Jesus for himself. And Jesus has completely transformed his life around. The first promise that he ever gave my dad when he was just a new Christian, a lady handed him a note in church. It was Jeremiah 29 verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. When everyone else has told you you don't belong, there is a God that says that you belong, that you are perfectly made, wonderfully made. And because of that, God chose, my dad chose to take God at his word. And he became, he started as just, he left school at 14 because he couldn't concentrate because of the messed up. He was sexually abused. He was so broken, he couldn't concentrate. So he left school and started just as a bum boy in a glass factory. But through that, God just started to be the dad that he never had. And he started to teach him in his word how to become a man. He would give him scriptures like, serve your earthly master as unto the Lord. And so he just built his way up in that company. Got lots of money from doing a job well and then became a farmer. And over years got incredibly successful to the point that he came back where he started as a bum boy. He came back, owned the entire business and all the commercial property in that entire uh, area. So we went from being the boy in the town that everyone said was broken, shouldn't belong. He's now the millionaire of the town. How redeeming is our God? That is only God, all five all five of us kids love Jesus, have amazing careers. God's favours over us because we chose to take God at his word that what other people said where well, we didn't belong, Jesus said you belong. And we've all got to have that security of how much we belong to Jesus, how much we are ordained to know him, to belong to him. I love that. You know what, I love that every one of us have a right to be his son and daughter. In John 1 verse 12, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we have the right to belong to Jesus. We have the right to know his love, the right to know his forgiveness. When we say, God, we're sorry, we have that right. The right to know his freedom, the right to know his value, the right to know security. You know, knowing that we belong to Jesus gives every one of us the security that we are looking for. But the question whether we will respond to that invitation that Jesus extends to us to belong is whether we will trust him. Eric Erickson, who's a famous psychologist, he looked at the different stages of identity and he said the first stage of our identity being marked is by who we will trust. And to trust in God, we need a revelation of his goodness. And that is why when you go back to John 10, Jesus is saying, come follow me because I am good. I'm the good shepherd who will intervene. I'm not a hired hand who's just gonna run when you're attacked. No, I'm the good shepherd who's gonna intervene on behalf of you. I am good. So we trust him because of his goodness. I love that in Luke, when it goes into more details of the calling of Peter to follow Jesus, it actually says that they caught this massive amount of fish because Jesus said to them, turn your nets over. He provided miraculously for them. So before he called him, he revealed his goodness to him. We have a good God. We have a God that we can trust. Come on, would we trust him, knowing that we belong to him, that we've been set apart for his purposes? I know the amazing thing too is when you look at it, the enemy deceived Eve because he got her to question the goodness of God. He said to her, oh, God knows if you eat that fruit, you're just gonna become like him. He's, trying to, he's kind of just trying to stop you from knowing his, the fullness of what you can know. How, is, how like that is the enemy he comes alongside us. He's like, God's just trying to stop you from doing that because he knows what you'll miss out on if you do. Come on, he deceived Eve because he got her to question his goodness. Come on, is the enemy trying to get you to question the goodness of God? I know he's done that in my own life sometimes. 
And when we get led down the path, we don't trust. And when we don't trust, we don't belong. And when we don't belong, we start entering into things that we should never enter into. We've got to know how much we can trust in the goodness of God. The second thing in knowing our identity is that Jesus extends the invitation to believe. I love John 6, verse 66 to 69 says, from that time on, many of his followers turned back to their old ways of living. They would not go along with him after that. And Jesus said to the 12 followers, will you leave me also? And I love this part. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, who else can we go to? You have the words of life that last forever. We believe and know you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And this is the invitation that Jesus gives us to believe in his word. I love the word of God because the word of God is freedom to us. The word of God is what defines us. If we look again at the journey of Jesus, you know when he's led into the desert and he's tempted by the enemy, the first thing the enemy does is get him to question his identity. He says to him, if you are the son of God, turn this into bread. And Jesus comes back at him and says these words. I love it. I love the answer of Jesus. He says, it is written, man is not to live on bread alone. Man is to live by every word that God speaks. God's Word is what defines us. It is the compass that directs us. If we do not have the truth of God's Word alive on the inside of us, there is no truth in our life to direct who we are called to be. And this is seriously where I get challenged at the moment and upset with uh, what I see happening in the world around us. Because all around us, we see this the lies of the enemy defining who we are as people rather than God's truth. And this is where we as the church, we've got to stand up and say, hey, God has a better way. There is the truth of God's Word that is there to set us free, that is there to be a compass of who He's called us to be, that we are children of the Most High God, that we are called to be in the image of who God has created us to be. It is the Word of God that defines us. Ephesians 4 verse 20 to 24 says, That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ. You were taught in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your formal way of life, to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. To put on the new self, we need a new set of directions. Come on, we are called to be in the image of Jesus Christ, but it is not who we are in our humanity. Because in our flesh, we want something different, but we're called to put on a new self that comes from following Jesus Christ because we are made in His image. Is this making sense today? See, to step into a new identity, we've got to step into a new set of directions. For my 40th, I was so blessed to be given um, some money from people to go and get a new wardrobe, to go shopping. And I went with Kina. She's, she's an expert in shopping. It's amazing. And you know what? To step into something new, I just had to take her directions. Not go to what I thought, but just to trust her, her directions. And it's the same when it comes to stepping into the image that God has called us to be. We're gonna trust His directions, trust a new set of identity that He's calling us to walk into. See, the old me thinks that I'm too insecure to do anything great for God, but the new me that I have knows to put on the fact that I'm able because it is He who is living through me. The old me gets self in the way, but the new me puts on selflessness because it's better to give than to receive. The old me is led by my desires, the new me, is led by the Holy Spirit who empowers me. The old me feels like temptation is too much to overcome, but the new me knows that God will uh, free me from the temptation and give me everything to overcome it. The old me wants to find my status and what others say about me, but the new me knows that true love only comes from Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna do everything to run to Him. Come on, we've got to keep setting aside the old us and putting on the new identity that we come and knowing His voice. See, I think one of the greatest challenges that we face today, knowing the invitation that Jesus calls us to believe is the wrestle of the Word of others versus His Word. The Word of others that is all around us at the moment versus the Word of God. Again, going back to John 10, it says, the sheep know my voice and they follow my voice, not the voice of a stranger. 
Are we following the Word of God when it comes to every area of our life? See, I think the whole abortion issue at the moment that has been brought up with Roe, their Supreme Court decision, the Roe and Wade decision that has been overturned. It's been interesting to see the narrative around this whole area of abortion. And for me, it's been heartbreaking to see the world thrust their narrative on us or through the media or through social media this week that we as women have a right to take life because we want to make our own decisions and our bodies are our right. And it's heartbreaking to see because it goes against the truth of God's Word, the truth that every life is sacred, that every life matters. And I'm going to turn to my notes here because I really want to make sure I get this right because this is weighed heavy on my heart this week. The truth of God's Word is that every human life is sacred, that from conception that life is a purpose and a plan that is ordained by God. I am living proof that God can redeem even the most broken of lives and bring restoration in His redemption. I get the complication of the issue, but when we apply human wisdom to our brokenness, it only leads to more brokenness. For example, one very key influential woman leader in the world posted after the Supreme Court decision, I'm heartbroken for the teenage girl full of yes and promise who won't be able to finish school or live the life she wants to because the state controls her reproductive decisions. And you know what? This can sound so compassionate and power to women. But let's break that statement down and what it actually means. That young woman was my grandma. And that decision that she made to give dad his life ended up being the greatest part of her legacy. What the world called a mistake ended up being her greatest success. I know it's a complicated issue, but gosh, if we keep bringing human wisdom to it, we're just going to continue going round and round in circles and we need God's wisdom. I naturally don't find this kind of stuff easy to talk about because I would hate someone to hear this and feel judged because I know that there'll be a woman listening online, a woman in this room today who would have had an abortion. And I want you to hear today that my heart breaks with you. And we as the church, we will not be known for what we're against, but what we are for. And that is why things like Embrace Grace is so incredibly important. What we do is Embrace Grace is a beautiful program where we stand with women who are vulnerable. Where we say, you know what, there is another way that you don't have to go where the world is telling you. But as a church, we will stand and say, hey, you know what, our God has another way. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we're called to stand with you, stand in the gap, stand with the vulnerable and say that you don't have to walk this out on your own, but that we are with you. And so I pray today that you don't hear judgment, but you hear the truth of God's word that there is another way. Because he loves you, because his wisdom, when we apply it to our lives, leads to so much beautiful fruit. I think another one of the big ones at the moment, especially for our young people and our young adults, is that your identity is based on what you feel. If you feel like you identify with another gender, then that's okay because that's how you feel. The first thing my son got asked when he went to high school was what his pronouns were. And I don't want, again, anybody to feel judged if you're in this place where you're wrestling with this stuff, but it is really important that as the church, we bring a voice to this because it's incredibly important that our young people, our young adults know that you are not your feelings that you are not defined by what you feel. I read a recent article lately where young people in Brisbane identified as cats. And so we're starting to be cats because that's where their feelings were taking them. Guys, we live in a messed up world today. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we've got to stand and say, you know what? That's not the truth of who God created you to be. And so I want every young person, every young adult to hear it today. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You are identified 
by who God has called you to be. You are identified. He made you perfectly. He made you wonderfully. There is no flaw in you. There is nothing He would change about you. And we have, we've got a world at the moment telling our young people and young adults that, you know what, you just work out who you are based on how you feel. And that is not God's truth for them. It is not God's love for them. We need to be a church that rises up and says, there is a God that so loves you that so has a better plan for you. And in saying this, we are never gonna be a church that's gonna judge people. It's one of the values of who we are as a church, that we are a place where everyone can walk in our doors and feel like they belong, where they will know the love of Jesus Christ no matter how they present themselves, no matter what is going on in their lives, they're gonna know our love and not our judgment. But then at the same time, we also need to stand declaring God's truth that you are perfectly, wonderfully made and that God has a better plan for you. Are you hearing my heart today? Because our identity comes from being defined in the Word of God. And you know what? This, this is something that all every one of us has to continue to face in our Christian walk. Because it's not just the stuff like gender and these abortion, these kind of things, but stuff that the enemy, the deceit that he will just continue to bring into our lives. Like you're not good enough. Who are you to be anybody? All the things he plays with our mind. And that's where as Christians, we've got to be strong with our thinking. We've got to be strong. Like 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the, as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Come on, there's some fight in there. There's some feistiness in there that when the enemy comes to deceive me, no, no, I'm not gonna have a bar of it because I know the Word of God. I'm gonna stand on the Word of God, on the truth of what He says about me. I'm not gonna buy into the enemy's lie. No, there's gonna be strength that I stand on. I'm gonna make my mind submit to the Word of God. I love what in Now, Neil T. Anderson says, the major strategy of Satan is to distort the character of God and the truth of who we are. He can't change God and he can't do anything to change our identity and our position in Christ. If, however, he can get us to believe a lie, we will live as though our identity in Christ isn't true. How powerful is that? Our identity is secure in who he has called us to be. The last thing is Jesus extends the invitation to build with him. And I love this part. Through the interactions that Jesus has with Peter, the most constant invitation that is there to Peter is, will you build with me? He says, come follow me and I will make you. I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 16, again, Jesus says to Peter, you are a rock on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. Then when Peter messes up and he's a fae, he denies Jesus. Jesus turns up to him and says three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says, well, feed my sheep. Come on, if you love me, feed my sheep. Come on, there's a cause. There is a purpose that is on the inside of each and every one of us. And until we know that purpose, until that purpose is unlocked in Jesus, there's always going to be a sense of something missing in our lives. Come on, He's called us to bring meaning to our lives because we choose to build our lives for what matters for eternity. And that is what expansion is all about. That is why as a church, we do not hesitate to say, hey guys, here's the cause. Here's the vision because it's the cause of Jesus Christ. It's the cause of building His church. It's the cause of building something that is greater than ourselves, greater than self. And when we do that, you know what it does to us? It builds us. Come on, we find ourselves because we find Jesus. And I love, just as we come to a close, I wrote this down, that it's in our belonging that we're secured in believing that we're defined and in building that we are purposed. And when we have, we respond to Jesus, the invitation He gives us to all those areas, we find ourselves. See, when we follow Jesus, we find ourselves. I love what Matthew 16, Jesus saying to His disciples, and this is what everything really comes back to. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? For what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? How powerful. You know, that Greek word for life, it means soul life. It's the psychological life of the human soul, our mind, our will and our emotions. And that can only be filled when we make the decision to follow Jesus. He is life and life in its abundance, life in its wholeness. It is only in saying no to who we wanna be in our own right and in our own selves that we find the hope of Jesus. And I know there are people here today There are people that are joining us online and you have never had the opportunity to open up your life to know the wonder of what it means to belong to Jesus. The wonder of what it means to know His love, to know His value, to know His security. And the most amazing thing is because Jesus came and died for us and then rose from the dead, all it means is us surrendering to Him. Saying, you know what, I'm not gonna try and live this life anymore on my own. I'm gonna surrender to you, Jesus. I'm gonna make the decision to call you Lord to call you God. And all it takes is a simple prayer of surrender, a prayer of saying, Jesus, this is a line in the sand for me where I wanna give you my life. When no longer I'm gonna wrestle on my own with self, now I surrender to you. And if you're here today while every eye is closed and heads are bowed to give people a private moment with Jesus right now, if you're here today and you know what, You'd say, hey, that's me today. I wanna make that decision to open up my life to Jesus, to discover the wonder of who He has called me to be, to take my life from one point and then follow Him and choose to live my life with Him as my God. Then through this prayer, this is an invitation to do this. If you're saying today and for all those online, that's me today, I wanna make the decision to make Jesus my Lord, to belong to Jesus then right where you're seated, why don't you just lift up your hand and say, hey, that's me today, fantastic, it's awesome. All those online, right where you're sitting, right where you're listening to this, you can just lift up your hand to Jesus and say, hey, that's me today. I know I'm making that decision to follow you today, to open up my life to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, why don't we repeat this prayer after me? Jesus, I invite you into my life. I ask you to be my God, to be my Lord. I thank you that from this point on, I belong to Jesus. I'm sorry for my wrongs. I want a new start in you. I wanna know you, to know your love, to know your forgiveness, to know your freedom, to know your joy. In Jesus' Name, everybody said, Amen. So awesome. You know, for all those that, made that decision, we'd love you to take a moment to fill out this card and just indicate the decision that you made today, whether it's a first time decision to follow Jesus, or today you're recommitting your life to follow Him. Make sure you do that. You can put it into the drop boxes you leave, or better still, go to our team at the information desk and they will get one of these Bibles to you. For all those that are joining us online, there's, gonna, there's a link right here that you can click into. Again, indicate the decision that you made and we will send one of these Bibles to you. And also an invitation to Alpha as well, which is all about it exploring what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be a Christian. would love to invite you to that as well. But I pray that we have he- heard it today. We've heard the wonder of our amazing God, how much He has for us, how much He wants to transform our lives because we make that decision to follow Him. And again, I forgot to say it, but if you wanna email Embrace Grace with any questions that you have, Kirsty, who leads Embrace Grace is an incredible woman of God and is an amazing person to talk to around any questions about abortion or any of that topic at all. She's an amazing person to talk to or to get involved in it as well. You can do that by just emailing Embrace Grace at the screen behind me as well, which would be awesome. But God, why don't we stand to our feet? And we lift our hands to heaven. God, I just thank you for the fact that we belong to you. That you have called us for such a time as this. That you love us more than we will ever understand. That you call us by name that You give us Your Word to define us, that You call us to build with You because You know that that's actually what matters for eternity. 
It's what truly matters for our lifetime. And God, I just thank You that You are a good God, that we can trust You. And I just pray if there's any areas of today where we can just highlight the enemy has brought deception, I just pray right now that the truth of Your Word would have its way. God, right now, I just pray for Your love to fall, for Your peace to fall. God, for all those that are joining us online, I just pray, God, that Your Holy Spirit would minister where it needs to. I just feel for some people right now, God's just highlighting areas of hurt and brokenness. And because of that hurt and brokenness, the enemy's just been able to bring deception there. And the Holy Spirit right now wants to bring His healing touch. The Holy Spirit right now just wants to pour out the love of God on that area because it's never God's intention for us to be hurt. It's the broken world that we live in and the deception of the enemy that causes it, not the heart of God. And I just pray right now for your restoration in that area, Jesus. I just thank you that you are the one that heals us, that you are the one that restores us, that you are a good God. And I just pray right now for your presence to keep changing us, that as we keep being led by you, that you will keep changing who we are into your image. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. And how amazing is our God? He is truly incredible.